Right, hello everyone, it's Andy here from Precision Hydration. Today I'm uh, chatting to someone from right over the other side of the world. I'm in Christchurch in Dorset in the UK. He's not actually in Christchurch, but he's n near to the other Christchurch in New Zealand and it is multi-sport adventure racer and triathlete Dougal Allen. Dougal, how are you doing? I'm oh, well, thanks, Andy. I didn't realise your hometown's Christchurch. It must have felt weird doing the coast to coast those many years ago and finishing in the Southern Hemisphere's version of Christchurch. It, it did, and it was it caused a lot of confusion for the locals because there was yeah, yeah. from Christchurch, and it's like, well, not not this Christchurch, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that's a good way to start, actually, because that was 2012, wasn't it? Um, and I that's when your name first came on my radar because i came over to do the coast to coast race that year it was something i'd wanted to do for for a very long time what um was that your was that one of your early races at coast to coast relatively speaking? well it was kind of I've, I've sort of had two coast to coast lives i had my first life which ran from i did the two day in 2008 and then what we call the one day event which is sort of the elite race uh in 2009 and every year from there to 2013 so the year you did it yeah. i guess so i was probably doing about my fourth race or fifth race yeah uh, and then i had a six-year hiatus doing triathlon and, and i've since gone back and done three more in a row so yeah i guess in the scheme of my coast to coast coast to coast career that would have been sort of in the middle yeah and for for the uneducated around coast to coast and adventure racing can you tell us a bit about it because it is such a huge deal in new zealand isn't it it's a massive event but still a little bit i would say unknown around the rest of the world yeah i i didn't realize how widely it was recognized throughout the world actually until i uh traveling for adventure races and, and ironman events and things i would talk about doing multi-sport in new zealand and people were sort of not sure what that meant until I said coast to coast and then they'd go oh I know what multi-sport is so it's essentially I would call it an off-road version of multi-sport or uh, sorry of triathlon or Ironman racing and and so you're replacing road running with trail running you're replacing swimming with kayaking sometimes other water sports but usually kayaking and you're replacing the road cycling with mountain biking however just to confuse things on the coast to coast it is road cycling so coast to coast is road cycling mountain running and kayaking yeah and it's a long it is called the longest day funnily enough but it is a long old day out isn't it what's your sort of you've won it a couple of times what what time does it take to win that event normally yeah the winner's the male winner is usually 11 hours. It's usually a pretty good day. Conditions are usually pretty favourable if the male goes under 11. And for the female winner, sort of around the 12-hour mark. So it's a big day. I guess it's about another 50% volume on top of an Ironman day. Uh, but very different. So quite hard to compare the two. But um, it is, yeah, it's a big day out. And all the same kind of things apply around the importance of managing nutrition and pacing yourself and and all those sorts of things that you would in the world of Ironman and other endurance events be very familiar with yeah it's um it was an interesting experience for me doing it because at the time I'd done a few Ironman events and I was looking for something new and interesting it, it had always been on my radar I you, you'll obviously be very familiar with um Steve Gurney who was kind of you know I guess love him or hate him has been the the name and the face associated with coast to coast for many years because he dominated the event for years and I used to watch him as a as a sort of a young teenager I watched Trans World Sport in the UK on the oh, team yeah. you would see Steve Gurney paddling paddling on this be beautiful like blue aqua blue water and running over a mountain and stuff and it just looked like it was such a cool thing to do and I I was doing triathlon and the big, I think the big difference with people doing triathlon, if they want to step into like adventure and coast to coast is the paddling piece, isn't it? Because it's the, the paddling in coast to coast is quite long. It's 70 Ks. It's, it's quite technical. There's some pretty, there can be some quite big white water. And so for me, I didn't really get a chance to do it until I'd taken a year out to sort of focus on doing some, some proper paddling. But 
from from your perspective as a as a New Zealander, was paddling something you were into before that, or did you get into paddling to do multi sport? Probably a little bit of both. I mean, I I went to a high school in New Zealand where there was an outdoor pursuits program, and uh, kayaking was a small part of that. And I'd say that's fairly typical of most New Zealand schools is that they that students will be exposed to some form of kayaking early in their life but no I mean I I really started to focus on kayaking from a skill set and a fitness point of view because of the coast to coast and other multi-sport races so I really didn't start to kayak with sort of real intent until I was probably about 20 years old so I definitely picked it up later in life and uh, you know it's it's a sport that I now truly truly love it's it would be my favorite sport of of all the different disciplines i do and i think a big part of that as you sort of mentioned before is just the water that we have to paddle on here beautiful lakes beautiful rivers uh even ocean paddling's a pretty vibrant scene in new zealand uh but on that note with the coast to coast uh you do the run follows rivers as you know and the kayak follows one big long 70 kilometer stretch of river we're very lucky in that the water quality is such that you can drink your way through the race, but perhaps as we might talk about later on, that, that can also <laughs> lead to a few issues for people that perhaps don't uh, appreciate or uh, put enough kind of planning and thought to electrolytes and things. So it's quite common actually in the coast to coast, and I'm a coach as well, for people to suffer pretty bad cramping, often really de- debilitating cramps. And usually when you dig a bit deeper, it's um, off the back of the last three or four hours of drinking sort of fresh water from rivers. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point to dive into because I was going to ask you about the approach to nutrition and hydration generally for these long races because I think there's obviously some some specifics to coast to coast like the ones that you've mentioned about being able to pick up water. I remember that being a total novelty for me to be able to take a small bottle on the run for three, four hour run and just scoop out the stream and drink as you needed to. That was really cool. But for Ironman, you know, or anything that's kind of that, ultra distance piece of a a day but a long day what are your principles of nutrition that you fall back on well i i probably like i guess any athlete i've sort of evolved in my thinking and my approach over the years and um you know carbohydrates is a very uh, hot topic when it comes to people talking about their nutritional strategy for a race calories or carbohydrates however you want to look at um, energy I guess and so I've always been pretty diligent I guess with getting the the carbs in through the race but uh, it is the electrolytes that sort of been a a real learning for me I guess in recent years and and definitely um, led to some real shifts positive shifts in my performances so I I use a spreadsheet before a big race like the coast to coast and I I calculate exactly how many carbs and how much sodium and to some extent how much caffeine I feel I require at various aspects within the race but also on the whole and then I go about basically putting together a list of products that I'll use th- through each part of the race to make sure that those numbers all add up. So that's kind of the approach I take. It, it leaves nothing to chance. And, um, yeah, as I say, I I have pretty specific targets that I like to hit. What, what sort of targets are you looking to hit with carbs per hour then? Do you work it out on an hourly basis or across the race? What, what's your, what are your numbers? Well, yeah, on an hourly basis, but also um, the target per hour will be dependent on the discipline that I'm looking at. So uh, for an Ironman, for example, you're obviously not going to take anything on during the swim. And and because of that, you know, I'll have slightly higher targets on the bike, A, because I'm probably in slight deficit when I start the ride, but also because I know from experience that I find it harder to digest carbohydrates while running. So I kind of want to make sure I start the run in as little deficit as possible. So my my targets are quite high on the bike in an Ironman. Uh, And and as I say, they sort of drop by about a third for the run. That's just... uh, me being realistic about what works for me for the coast to coast uh you get into the kayak about midday so you start at 6 a.m you get in the kayak at about midday you will be 
depleted. It's just so hard to keep up with uh, energy requirements through the through the run you basically be running for most of that morning and so in the kayak i can take a lot more carbohydrates than i can in any other sport or any other race that i've ever done so for me it's probably up around 140 150 grams per hour of carbohydrates a because i'm in catch-up mode and b because i find sitting in a kayak my digestive system seems to um yeah process more efficiently those carbs that's that's huge. What out of interest? How does that compare with how many grams an hour you try to hit on the bike during an Ironman? Yeah, considerably more. I'm probably around ninety to a hundred grams of carbs per hour on the bike, which again is pretty pretty high, eh? For for most athletes, a lot of people will hear that and go, "Gee, that's pretty high." But I, I'm a bigger person. I'm I've got quite a high metabolism, and and I've always been pretty fortunate in that my gut tends to tolerate that that amount of carbohydrates, provided I'm using products that seem to work for my stomach and and on that note we talk a lot to athletes about training the gut because it's something you can't expect to sort of eat low carbs in training and then suddenly throw them up all at you on the day and hope that it works do you do you tend to train with a reasonable amount of carbohydrates most of the time or do you do a specific training phase where you up the amounts yeah probably the latter more so i i like to You know, at this time of year in New Zealand, it's our winter. I'm doing a lot of just sort of base mileage, aerobic mileage. So I'll um, I'll often do reasonably long aerobic sessions, just actually with pH. um, You know, a sodium formula that doesn't offer me really any carbohydrates Um, as race day approaches maybe sort of six to eight weeks out I'll start to introduce more carbs into those sessions and then as those kind of key sessions come along where I'm actually simulating the pace or the power or the heart rate that I expect to do on race day I'll also um, you know you train your legs you also want to train your gut so I'll start to really focus on those key sort of targeted amounts that I plan to use on race day yeah and do you do you use a combination of like liquid calories and gels and chews and bars and things when you're racing or do you have a format that is your favorite yeah i've I've, it's evolved again i've probably come to a point now where i tend to rely on my fluids for my electrolytes and i rely more on sort of gels and bars perhaps for my carbs so i don't tend to cross them over to any real extent i know gels will often tell you they've got sodium in them and they will but it's not really of any level of significance so as i say it's sort of the bottle's got my sodium in it and the pocket has my carbs in it and that's just what works for me yeah and one of the reasons that you and i started a dialogue probably a couple of years ago now about this was that you did our our online course with Training Peaks about the science of endurance hydration and I think found it pretty useful for, for cementing some of your ideas around sodium intake because like like me, you appear to be someone who needs a high level of sodium compared to others when racing. So talk, talk to me about that sort of journey, like what was happening before, what's been happening after and, and also what you found with athletes that you've coached with that approach. Yeah, and that that course, um, I've recommended it and I'll continue to recommend it to athletes and coaches. I I registered for the course mostly with my coaching hat on. I, I, uh, hydration was a hot topic all the time in my conversations with my athletes and I just felt underqualified to give good advice I had experience based advice but I'm a I was cramping and I didn't feel like the right person to be giving advice so I found that course through training peaks and I thought this is exactly what I need and as I made my way through the course a lot of the the conversations I was having with athletes started to make a bit more sense to me but also uh I was starting to really relate to a lot of the examples used in the course and uh, there were quite a few light bulb moments where it was actually uh, things that I felt applied to me as an athlete uh, that that made that course so so useful moving forward. It, It changed a lot of what I started to do for myself but it also changed uh, a lot of the way I was um, I guess supporting my athletes in their approach to race day and I think of one athlete in particular who actually was starting to develop almost like a 
a serious anxiety around doing an Ironman because every Ironman he had done, he would get in the swim, on the bike, and on the run, serious cramps, like really painful cramps. It was humiliating on the run course because there's mm. spectators around and he's bent forward trying to manage cramps. And it got to a point where he was wondering whether he should ever do an Ironman again because, as I say, it was it was really creating anxiety. So some of the things I was learning on the course, I was busy writing down all these notes and I pretty much uh, sent him word for word some of the recommendations that came from the course, which essentially centred around being more sodium centric in your approach to hydration. And uh, he emailed me the day after Ironman New Zealand that year. This is about two or three years ago. And um, I mean, he had a pretty good result, but above all, he was just so excited to tell me that he didn't suffer a single cramp. Yeah. Up until that point, he had pretty much self labeled himself a cramper. It's just mm. he was a cramper and that's what he called himself. And all of a sudden, he did a full Ironman without cramp, and that was the that was the big shift. So, yeah, the science of hydration course was a big uh, shift for me as a coach, but also as an athlete. And and I probably up until that point targeted around seven to eight hundred milligrams of sodium per hour in my races. Obviously, that changes a little bit if you're going into a hotter or a cooler climate, but that was sort of my my benchmark, and that pretty much doubled after that course. And um, yeah. yeah, the the cramping episodes, but also just you know when your your muscles are functioning well and when they're not, and and my muscle function, anecdotally, just improved so much as a result. Definitely, and I think that's that's an interesting one actually because we we obviously work with a number of athletes doing Ironman and that kind of thing, and that a lot of people, especially late on in an Ironman, and you you'll know exactly this feeling. Report that that sort of like quadricep shut down you know everything just goes solid and it's like yeah. your muscles are being beaten up and although a lot of that has to do with the mechanical pounding and you know a lot a lot of the athletes that get that though are people who've put the training miles in you know it's not necessarily just a pure muscle breakdown thing and i'm i'm a big believer in the fact that sometimes that can be an electrolyte balance issue certainly when if i go to the extreme when i was taking insufficient sodium in my longer races not only was i cramping up a lot but the the muscle damage the day after was horrific and, yeah and they sort of you know like walking the, all the classic walking down the stairs backwards and those sort of things yet actually getting that that fluid electrolyte balance into sync i think helps with with that although you know you can talk to as many people on the internet who think it's a load of old rubbish but you know we've all got our opinions in that area yeah that's right yeah good stuff um, so move, just staying in with the, the coast to coast theme for a minute, um, bringing it up to date because you had an interesting race at coast to coast in this year, 2021. And I wanted to ask you about one aspect of it because you ended up winning, which is the big headline story. But I don't know if ever, a lot of people would realize that I think you were sort of trailing in the race for over 10 hours of like an 11 hour race. So you were basically not in the lead for the vast, vast majority of the time. So just, I, I think that's quite interesting. So talk us through the psychology of like, was that deliberate? Were you sort of stalking someone or were you were you trying to get in the lead and just couldn't until the, until the death? Yeah, probably a little bit of both. I mean, I, I was quite aware of my competition on the day and where their strengths and weaknesses lay relative to mine. And uh, I just knew that for me to win the race, I had to really stick to my own sort of race plan and play to my strengths. The run, which happens, basically you've got a 55K group ride that takes you up into the mountains. And then you've got one of the real key parts of the race is a 30K uh, mountain run, which you're climbing over rocks, crossing rivers about 25 times. And it's really rugged stuff. And, uh, and after that, you've, you've essentially got a long hike and a long sort of individual time trial. So in the scheme of things, I, I backed myself to be the best kayaker on the day and I backed myself to be the best cyclist on the day. And I didn't back myself to be the best rudder on the day, but I didn't feel I needed to be necessarily. And so that's more or less how it unfolded. Uh, Sam Manson took the lead on the mountain run. Um, you could speculate as to whether he pushed himself hard relative to how hard I pushed myself, but 
at the end of the day, it, it probably doesn't matter too much. The fact is he had about a seven or eight minute lead at the end of the mountain run. I finished the run feeling really good. I'd managed myself really well. I'd, I'd kept an eye on heart rate. I'd got the nutrition right exactly as planned. And so I felt like I could really turn it up a notch, I guess, going into that second half of the day, which mentally is a good place to be. But in reality, when you're not leading, it's just so much harder to believe that you can win a race, and especially when it's an eight-minute deficit. So um, make no mistake, I, I was having some doubts as to whether I would be able to do enough to win the race. Uh, but I just kept chipping away. It's it's a long, lonely day. You don't really know what's going on. And, and I was on the uh, river in the kayak for about the first three hours. I, I had no idea whether I was making ground or losing ground, and... People might want to just have a moment and think about that three hours of kayaking at race effort with no idea whether you're going faster or slower than your competition. You don't, you barely see anyone on the river, just a few mm. safety kayakers and things. So that was a long, long time in, in my life, three hours. But with an hour to go, it's about a four hour kayak. You sort of pop out the end of the gorge and you start to see people and someone gave me a split and it was someone I knew, so I sort of trusted it, and they had said it was three and a half minute gap. So I thought that's that's great news, you know. I'm I'm really in striking distance here, so maybe there was uh, a mental shift there that started to play into my hands a little bit. I started to truly believe that I was in the right place to to win the race, and then climbed on my bike. And I I do love to be in the time trial bike and just grinding away into a bit of a headwind, yeah. and that's where I made the pass about twenty kilometres into the seventy kilometre ride. So about fifty k to go, I I passed Sam, and uh, didn't look back. I think I won by about eight or nine minutes in the end. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it was um, kind of to the wire, but also not in that respect as you your two races did that at, at one point didn't they as he was on the way down and you were on the you know on the way up and I remember I do remember vividly the, the most one of my most vivid memories from the race is that coming out the gorge and you start to see people in the kayak and you do get a bit of information don't you and a bit of encouragement and you, it is it's like if you're racing through the night and when the sun comes up sort of that that kind of moment and it you, you get refocused and everything. What what I found hilarious though was when I got to the end of the kayak, and you'll have seen this many times over, is I told my legs to get out of the boat, but they, they wouldn't do it. And there's there's a few photos of my support crew like actually arms under my arm, hands under my armpits, like dragging me over the rocks to get to the bar. Yeah. I I challenge anyone to look good at that part of the race, eh? Because when you think about it, you've run 30 kilometers through the mountains and then you've sort of sat and that sort of 90 degree angle at the waist yeah. <laughs> for four hours. And if there's ever a recipe for doms, it's to run as hard as you can through the mountains for three or four hours and then sit at 90 degrees and not, not shift your hips out of that position for four hours. Yeah. No, it's, um, it, it will always be with me, that one. There's a, like you say, there's a fairly embarrassing, incriminating photo of me somewhere <laughs> at home looking, looking like I need help. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure when you got to the sand at the finish, you looked better though, because you will have flushed a bit of, you know, a bit of metabolites out of the legs with a 70k oh. warm down. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the and the sight of that, what was back then, a can of spades, you know, lager waiting for me at the finish. I actually, I don't know if you 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 remember because you would have been off celebrating by the time I came in, but I were, I proposed to my now wife, my I do. girl Lucy, at the finish line. So yeah, it was that was on. Memory that was on the doco if anyone wants to see it you type into youtube uh 2012 was it 2012 2012 yeah yeah coast to coast and the sports hub it's about a 25 minute doco you can still watch it on youtube and it's got you proposing at the finish i didn't even know that i'll have to i'll have to look that one up yeah show the kids. yeah that's right yeah <laughs> yeah ah uh, good cool. one um, what's the English? What's the English version of Spates? What's your like dirty sort of you know reliable cheap kind of beer? Oh, what would it be? I don't. It, it's not actually. When I was growing up, the the sort of cheap lager that you drink was Foster's, but that's an Aussie brand, you know. So, uh, okay. But it. But that I don't even know. Ironically, I don't even know if they say it in Australia. Really, it's just kind of <laughs> not even the Aussies want it. Beer, but it's like yeah, Foster's. Foster's lager, 
probably but yeah same same kind of deal i guess yeah i've actually still got my little it's empty now obviously but i've still got my little pristine spates coast to coast edition can at home somewhere it's one of my most treasured race treasured race memories that one nice yeah so um i'm gonna ask you about two other things dude if that's all right um yeah first one is the is another recent race the god's own adventure race that you did this year because you were a late call up to a team that included um an absolute sort of sporting legend richie mccaw the new zealand rugby captain and what was it like getting that call up and and how was it being part of the team you know racing with richie oh it was fantastic and i won't lie you know um, richie being part of the team was was it a factor in me deciding with five days notice so it was five days before the race started that uh, Simone Meyer our other teammate called me and said um, there's been a, a, a shift in lockdown levels in Auckland due to COVID and their teammate couldn't basically leave the Auckland region to get to Rotorua where the event was and would I step in and race and uh, yeah I I, I guess I always knew I'd say yes because I just love these sorts of opportunities in life. Uh, but I, you know, I had to sort of think about it momentarily. But yeah, Richie being part of the team was a big appeal. Um, I didn't know Theo, our other teammate, and he was charged with the um, position of lead navigator. So I was a little bit nervous about um, jumping into a team where I didn't really know how good the navigator would be because navigation is such a pivotal role in these events. Mm. But uh, I said yes, and I flew to the North Island three days later and uh, lost a lot of sleep in the lead-in just with the stress of trying to get myself organised. And, of course, that stressed me out even more because you need sleep leading into an expedition adventure race like that because you don't get a lot during the race. So it was a it was a heck of a time trying to get my um, myself to the event and ready to race, but once the gun went, it was just a lot of fun. We we raced to second place. It took us nearly a hundred and thirty hours, which is about five and a half days. Yeah, and uh, and our team was great. Theo was an incredible navigator. Uh, Simone, I've raced with an um, an adventure races for a long time now, and I. I personally wouldn't choose another teammate. She's just incredible. And uh, Richie McCaw is everything you'd expect him to be from following his rugby career. He's just tough. He's intelligent. He's brave. He's uh, capable. Um, and so, yeah, the four of us, luckily, having not really uh, had much to do with each other before, came together and just performed really well as a unit. And uh, it, it will be a highlight of my racing career to reflect on that event because it was pretty amazing yeah sounds good on on that on that note you mentioned you know these these guys and girls being superb teammates what makes a really good teammate for a 130 hour expedition race yeah great question and and everyone probably has a slightly different interpretation about what makes a good teammate but to me a good teammate is somebody who uh I guess has has their teammates back and uh, and likewise you know that you will always feel safe around the people that you're with because they have your uh, wants and needs foremost in their mind at all times and so that that's essentially what we had and and you'll notice in the these events that the successful teams are exactly that they're they're the teams that uh, look after each other keep each other safe and and um as I say, there's there's sort of no egos. You're always wanting to help or be helped for the good of the team and that sort of thing. And usually that's something that comes with a bit of time and experience being around each other through multiple events. But as I say, um, it was our first time coming together and, and we clicked and we looked after each other and, and we had a lot of fun, which was probably part of the success too, was just enjoying each other's company for five and a half days. Yeah, because it's a lot more. Yeah, I guess there's sort of like the gelling of the characters as much as anything else has got to be has got to be spot on because you are living in very close quarters under very stressful circumstances, aren't you? In in that situation. Yeah, yeah, and you need to trust each other. You need to trust that if someone needs to stop to address a hot spot on their foot before it manifests into a big blister, which can be a, a race ending catastrophe, really. You need to trust that they're stopping because of it. it's a real thing. And likewise, the person calling for the team to stop needs to, you know, have that trust in their team that they can 
show a uh, a weakness in, in some way, you know, that's where ego is dangerous. If you sort of go, oh, I've got a hot spot on my heel, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to be perceived as weak. That can be yeah. the uh, the mistake that ends the race. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's it's amazing how that all came together for you guys. Um, another thing, just changing again, Dougal, is you've obviously um, you've got a young family, same as me. One thing that I've had a, had some really good feedback on from athletes that we that we work with is is talking about you know the way that you kind of fit training and the kind of if you like the work life training balance thing how do you how do you navigate that and how have things changed for you since you become a dad yeah it's at times you consider it a bigger challenge but at other times you sort of consider it a secret weapon having having kids and a wife that love what you do and support what you do and um so you know it can be a it can be a compromise on your time and energy at times, but I think uh, on the whole, it's it's just so fulfilling to be involved in sport, knowing that uh, if you have a good race or a bad race or a good training day or a bad training day, you come home to your kids and and you're still dad, and they don't actually care what you've done out on the sports field, so to speak. Um, it, it just restores a bit of healthy perspective, I think. Uh, it probably demands a little bit more organisation. You need to sort of be able to plan ahead a little bit better and make sure that you're getting those key sessions in. But probably more importantly, that you're finding windows to recover uh, because I'm a big believer that, you know, the only training you benefit from is the training you're recovering from. So uh, that's an area I think I, I still continue to learn and, and get better at because often it's the recovery that gets pushed to the bottom of the pile I, I suppose so yeah it's an ongoing um, process I'm certainly not an expert at it my kids are uh, far, uh, five and seven so uh, I've still got to navigate the teenage years and things like that but uh, I probably won't be competing professionally by that stage yeah yeah you're in the same you're in the same zone as me as we record mine are four and seven and I think you know definitely what's been nice recently for me is um, my little boy started riding his bike a bit more so very occasionally don't do it often but we go out and he can ride his bike fast enough for me to have a decent run you know running with him um, nice that's quite cool um, does he does he carry the bottles and feed you and that's a good idea I should probably broach that one with him actually yeah see if I can get, him, <laughs> get him out for long enough to, uh, to to feed me as we're going along and then the other thing that this is not really training but and we started to do a little bit of indoor rock climbing, which is one of those which is one of those cool sports where you can both go and actually do something at your own level. And um, and I have to say, Bobby, my son, is very into that kind of he's quite little and wiry and he's definitely it doesn't appear anyway he's gonna be like a into rugby or anything like that. But if you send him scampering up a wall, he's he's pretty good. And I honestly don't think on the bouldering stuff we're doing, I don't think it would be too many weeks before he's showing me how to do a few moves and that's really nice that we can both do something at our own level together as it were uh, yeah that's cool eh? and it just shows too that uh, they are so uh, observant they're so influenced I guess by the ways that we behave around them and for him to watch you going out and, and keeping active and prioritizing your health and fitness hopefully those those sorts of values um, filter down and our kids do the same De definitely i mean i think my kids because my wife runs and rides her bike and does all that sort of stuff our kids think it's pretty normal for mums and dads to go out in the morning and, and do that sort of thing and I, re I think that is hopefully a really healthy thing i think if i'd have if i'd have been a dad 15 years ago or something i'd have been a lot more i'd have a lot a lot more ideas about my kids doing competitive sport and whilst i'm fully up for encouraging them to do competitive sport i don't know that i'm uh, as enthused as i would have been about the idea of them doing that unless it's through their own choosing what's what's your sort of because obviously as a professional athlete you're at the very and a professional athlete at the very highest level in your sport it's it's how you've made your living and, and that kind of thing what how do you see that influencing your kids do you have aspirations for them to go into pro sport 
No, I'm probably a bit like you. I, I certainly wouldn't push it, but I'd also support it if that's the direction they chose to go. But I often remind myself and people around me that I didn't find multi-sport until I was 21 years old. So uh, that whole early specialisation model I don't subscribe to. Uh, Flynn's interested in football at the moment, so he's kicking a football around. Notice how I resisted calling it soccer? Yeah, that's um, And... Uh, he, like, yeah, yeah, and he's doing jumps on his bike and he's skateboarding and he's just he's moving in so many directions and I just love to see him doing that. Matilda's the same; she likes to dance. She's doing gymnastics, and so they're just developing nice broad movement patterns. And mm. like I say, I didn't find multi sport until I was twenty one years old, and up until that point, I was doing rugby and basketball and things. So. Uh, I don't really care what they do in their early years. I just hope that they do lots of different things, I guess. Yeah, I think that's really good because my my kids are around other kids who are doing a bit of early specialisation. There's kids that are very good at football who are in academy programmes. There's kids that are good at gymnastics or dance or swimming and they're, they're getting pushed pretty hard into those. And I definitely, I definitely think that being an athlete yourself and I was like you, although I specialised in triathlon in my te late teens, I had a pretty diverse, you know, football, cross-country running, swimming, this and that, racket sports and stuff up until then. And I do think that that, and the data actually supports the idea that early specialisation is not always the way. You hear about the Tiger Woods and the Serena Williams and those sort of people, but they're the exception, not the, not the rule, really. And I think that's a good message to get out. Yeah, totally agree. Good stuff. Well, I'm aware that we've taken up a lot of your time today, Diggle, but it's um, it's always always a pleasure to chat. I'm going to say say this now that I will be coming back to New Zealand at some point to do the coast to coast because mm. my my wife is mad keen to go back for a, another. We we hired a camper van last time. I think we'll do the same. Show the kids all of the great places that we went to. We made some fantastic friends while we were there that we need to come back and visit. So. If you're not racing, can I borrow your boat, do you think? Uh, <laughs> yeah. If I'm not racing, you can borrow my boat. But even if I am racing, uh, you, you just keep in touch because we love having uh, the athletes that come from overseas. It's an event that, realistically, it's an event that just suits those people that can be familiar with the uniqueness of the course. And so when it when a competitor comes from overseas I'd like to think all us Kiwis like to get in behind them and support them in whatever way we can lend them kayaks lend them support crew those sorts of logistical uh, barriers can be make or break for some people and we just love to see foreigners coming and uh, having a crack at the race so yeah I would love to see you back and see if you can bring a few of your British mates across Joe Skipper's talked about it but uh, oh, he's yet to yeah. I'll mention it to we'll, we'll mention it to Joe then because he would obviously if he can learn to paddle he'd be a force to be reckoned with I think certainly I'd say so I'd yeah. say so yeah no the, I, going back to what you said about the hospitality and help that's something which was so so for me in 2012 that was a big fear it was like going across how do I get a boat who's going to be support crew all this sort of stuff I put a message on the one of the message boards around coast to coast on and a guy called john crombie i don't know if you know john yeah i know jc yep john, yeah so jc just sort of put a message up he said i'm going he responded to my message said i'm going on holiday for a few days if no one else has put their hand up before i get you know by the time i get back then you're on i'll i'll, I'll crew you and and sure enough he lived up to his promise and was like the most him and uh, mark frisbee his mate was oh, yeah. it? like the the most hospitable people and they just took us in like family basically for a for a couple of weeks showed us the run course i paddled the river with them um, and also richard and elena russia were really nice as well they i did a bit of paddling with richard because he obviously knows the river he's won the race numerous times hasn't he and knows yep. the river really well and it was just like the the friendliest loveliest experience so yeah we'll we'll definitely we'll definitely be back at some point too to come and do it all again awesome look forward to it and anyone listening if they've got it on their radar and they're not from new zealand that would be exactly what i'd suggest they find the uh the training i think it's called each year they they update the facebook page but 
for example, the current page is called the 2022 Coast to Coast Training Group page or something, and uh, start there because you'll be amazed at how many Kiwis will um, step up and support, as I say, people coming from overseas to experience the race. Yeah, definitely. That's the, that's the recommendation. Well, well, good stuff. Well, lovely to catch up with you. Um, hopefully, we'll see you in New Zealand if I make it down there soon. And if not, if you make it to Europe, you know where to find us. If you come and, come and check in. Um, otherwise, yeah. keep us up to date with what you're doing. And it's, it's great to have you as part of the wider Precision Hydration family. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Good to chat. And um, definitely, I'd love to come and stop by the precision hydration home base over there and see what see what it's all about but uh yeah thanks for obviously sharing your knowledge with me through the training picks course but also i've always been so impressed when i've reached out to the precision precision hydration team through emails um at how responsive you guys are and uh, just finally there's a really good example there where i'd ordered some product I'm not the most organized person in the world. I was flying to France to do the Embran Man Extreme Triathlon, ordered the product with about three days notice. I think uh, the Aussie team sort of said, oh, that could be touch and go. And uh, I, I flew out before it arrived, arrived in France, and then your team in the UK uh, sent a package directly to my apartment in, in the middle of the French Alps. And I was able to use my preferred hydration for the, for the race to, to good success. So, yeah, um, wonderful what you guys do for your customers. And it's just a pleasure to be involved. Brilliant. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that well. Good, good stuff. Well, thanks again, Dougal. Have a great evening down there in New Zealand. And we'll talk to you again soon. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye.